And now to introduce to you our first keynote speaker, David Hinton. David has published numerous books of poetry and essays, many translations of ancient Chinese poetry and philosophy that create contemporary works of compelling literary power, while also conveying the density and texture of the originals. His most recent book is Wild Mind of Wild Earth, our place in the sixth mass extinction. These books are all informed by an abiding interest in deep ecological thinking and exploring the leaf of consciousness and landscape. This work has earned wide acclaim and many national awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and both of the major awards given for poetry translation in the US, the Landon Translation Award and the Pan American Translation Award. Most recently, Tink received a Lifetime Achieving Award from the American Academy's Arts and Letters. The title for David's keynote today is Wild Mind, Wild Earth, the Sun and Ecology in an Age of Extinction. Please join me in welcoming David Hinton. Evening landscape, <clears throat> clearing snow. Walking stick in hand, I watch snow clear. 10,000 clouds and streams bank up. Woodcutters return to their simple homes. And soon, a cold sun sets among risking peaks. A wildfire burns among ridgeline grasses. Scraps of mist rise born of rock and pine. On the road back to a mountain monastery, I hear it struck, that bell of evening skies. <laughs> All right, back to where I was going to start. <laughs> But like, that's a, a, a Zen Buddhist, a Chan Buddhist poem uh, it, in which that, that bell is more articulate than any, any, any clutch of language is likely to be. Before intention and choice, before ideas and understanding and everything we think we know about ourselves, we love this world around us. How can that be? How can we love all this when our cultural assumptions tell us in so many ways that we humans are fundamentally other than nature and that nature's only real value is how it supports our well-being? There's no love in that. Doesn't love require kindred natures? And what is kinship with wild earth but wild mind? How else could we feel exhilarating awe when a majestic orca whale leaps joyfully? Yes, forget anthropomorphism because they are so like us, so kindred. Leaps joyfully out of the water, twisting spectacularly as it crashes back down, playing or celebrating or defiantly shouting, I'm here, I'm me, to the world, to rivals, to family. And how else could we feel delight at orcas birthing underwater midwifery and nurturing their young? Or feel grief that southern resident orcas of the northwest coast are slowly starving to death, anger and guilt that it's because of us, the noise of industrial ship traffic disrupting the echolocation they need to locate prey, polluted seawater, Chinook salmon, their traditional prey, decimated by dammed rivers and overfishing and environmental toxins. We love this world, this living planet. We feel joy when life thrives, grief when it suffers and dies. This may seem obvious and uninteresting in and of itself, but it's a mystery, isn't it? Because given our Western assumptions, it's inexplicable. So that's a place that actually Claire described um, very beautifully just a minute ago. Um, and that's kind of the place I want to sort of uh, talk and um, 
uh, explore. Um, so to start with, um, what makes this feel so different? Um, how we came to this place, how we feel um, separated from quote unquote nature, um, and how that still is a, a completely unthought assumption for our culture, um, and then maybe what you know what to do about it. And we can see that how unthought that assumption is because it's built into our language. Like the word nature is by definition everything other than the human, right? It's every time we say the word nature, we're defining ourselves as separate from everything else. Um, and that wasn't true for our ancestors, the Paleolithic hunter-gatherers. They experienced themselves as completely integral with um, uh, the rest of the world. And so I'm gonna go through a quick history here. <clears throat> that was true for hundreds of thousands of years and then five or 10,000 years ago, the Neolithic began when humans settled into farming um, and agriculture. When that happened, suddenly there was this human space separate from everything else. As it was the villages that people lived in as opposed to everything else, the fields they were cultivating which had to be kind of protected from, you know, wild nature. And they began uh, caring for, mm, controlling domestic animals. So suddenly they have the, with the Neolithic, humans took on this kind of instrumental and exploitative relation to the land, to earth. Um, before that, in the Paleolithic, earth had been experienced more as this kind of hugely, um, this kind of, as just this huge gift-giving being, right? It was all, they, the experience was there was all this bounty, and we were grateful for this bounty. Once the Neolithic starts, it's like you have to struggle to like eat your living out. So the Neolithic quickly led to cities and writing began. And the writing was a second gigantic um, transformation in consciousness, I think. Um, because it defined, once you, once you can write your thoughts down, that's a radically different experience of yourself because then this interior world becomes apparently timeless and permanent because you can write your thoughts down there. You can come back to them years later and they're still there. Other people can come to them thousands of years later like I do with the ancient Chinese texts and on the other side of the world. And there they are, they haven't changed. And so that creates this illusion of a permanent, um, got almost eternal interior self. Um, that, and then that was even more exacerbated with alphabetic language and language, uh, language probably began pictographically with this direct relation between words and things. So there was some connection. Um, but it quickly became alphabetic in which there's no direct relation between the words and things. It's a, it's a, it's a the alphabetic construction that um, reflect, that matches, refers to a thing in the world as uh, arbitrary. In every language, it's different. <clears throat> so then the Greek philosophers, um, not long after writing really took hold of consciousness, Greek philosophy happened, ancient Greek philosophy. And they kind of um, mythologized uh, or reified that, that illusory self that writing created into a, a sort of soul, a, this kind of permanent entity that's more real than anything. And that matches up with sort of the world of forms and the world of ideas, all of which are permanent because they don't change. So, and so they were thought to be more real than changing nature. And we'll come back, I'll come back to why that matters to you when I talk about China. <clears throat> then after, not too long after that, Christianity came along and that um, did, did sort of mythologize that, that um, permanent interior self. Um, and sort of Genesis said, the whole mythology was the, the world is created for humans for humans to use and exploit. So that kind of mythologized the Neolithic relation to the land. <clears throat> um, all of which creates a radical separation between us, consciousness, human consciousness, and the world. 
So at this, at this point, there's this t radical separation between the world and us. And I was going to read this little passage. <clears throat> William Radford, one of the most, one of the prominent pilgrims who came from here to uh, the U.S. to North America. In 1620, he wrote this in his journal when he arrived off of um, Cape Cod and was looking out at North America. Um, he described what he saw as a hideous and desolate wilderness full of wild beasts and wild men. So for him, for the culture at large, European culture at large, at that point, nature was just considered kind of evil, something that had to be shaped into sort of God's order or at least the agricultural order. Um, <clears throat> and that's sort of where Western culture was. And um, beginning around the time of Bradford, a transformation happened that we don't even notice. I mean, like I was reading, we do feel this kind of kinship with nature now. Where did it come from, given that those are deep structural sources of Western tradition don't allow for it? Well, the, the amazing thing is it came largely from the Paleolithic. It came from Native Americans. Um, I love this story. Um, which I didn't know until a while ago when I was doing research for this new book. Um, what happened in the 17th and 18th century is that stories from America were getting back to Europe. Um, travel logs, people would travel in the US and they would see how Native culture worked and how Native culture was so woven into the natural world, how they experienced the natural world as sustaining and kindred. And at the same time, people were talking to Native Americans, sort of elders and sages and philosophers. Yeah, they really did have kind of philosophers. Um, and uh, started learning, I mean, listening to how, how the Native Americans thought about um, themselves in the natural world. So these accounts started being published in, the, in Europe and were actually wildly popular. And they are hugely influential uh, among int intellectuals, the German romantics, people like Rousseau in France. And um, I think most important for us right now is here in England on the British romantic poets, Wordsworth and Coleridge and Schelling. It sort of opened them to this feeling that they were having that nature was sustaining, it was an antidote to, to um, to civilization, to industrialization and commercialization. Um, you even hear, uh, I was gonna read one little tiny um, excerpt from Wordsworth's um, Preludes, where he's describing himself as a child or maybe an imagination of his childhood <clears throat> before he was uh, debased by industrialization and commercialization and, this, and the urban uh, <clears throat> he says that, that he, that he, and now here's the quote, bronzed with a deep radiance, stood alone beneath the sky as if I had been born on Indian plains and from my mother's hut had run abroad in wantonness to sport a naked savage in a thunder shower. <clears throat> so he very explicitly was imagining himself as a Native American. And that's his ideal world, this, this immediate contact, physical contact with, with nature. And then that leads to, you know, British Romanticism. And then British Romanticism gets, and also German Romantics and Rousseau and all other European stuff, but especially the British Romantic poets, gets passed back to the U.S. Yeah, Marcel and Thoreau, the, Amer the American Romantics, and then on to John Muir. So it's amazing how this line just works. On to John Muir, and then John Muir was very influential in politically in the U.S. And starting, he started the Sierra Club, this hugely influential environmental organization. Um, and he was the person who was like talking to presidents and Oregon and, and got prep people, the political world, thinking about protecting environment. Um, so it's just amazing to me that that our feeling right now of kinship 
or of any kind of like love for the natural world and any kind of like eco hope came from Native America. It's like Native American resistance alive in us. Um, so, <clears throat> kinship is not um, a kind of unthought assumption for us as it was for Native Americans. It's something that we have to cultivate and think about. And that brings me to China, which is my real place, where, um, and I think we have, to, we have to cultivate it because technology and science are not gonna solve this by themselves. It is, they're, they're deployed according to the culture's assumptions. Um, so if our culture's assumptions are that uh, non-human is of no value except as a kind of resource base, um, which is the gen has been the sort of broad assumption in the, in, in the, the West and the whole world, um, then that's how science and technology will be deployed. When it gets like you need to change your basic assumptions about things, your philosophical, spiritual assumptions, even almost, you know, you maybe religious, I don't know. Um, so ancient China had a very similar history to the West, but it happened 3,000 years earlier. There was a, a, a kind of monotheistic, um, monolithic um, theocracy um, in which people experienced themselves as spirits, as radically separate from the world, same as we did. Uh, and that all, that all collapsed about 3,000 years ago for various reasons. And then the golden age of Chinese philosophy was all about creating a new way of understanding society and our relation to the, um, to the world and the nature of reality and the nature of consciousness. Um, um, and out of that grew Taoism and uh, Chan Buddhism. Chan is the ch original Chinese word for Zen. Um, but it, when it moved to Japan, the Japanese pronounced that uh, ideogram Zen. So I'll use the word Chan. Um, and the whole, as spiritual philosophies, the whole um, point of Chan and Taoism are reweaving consciousness with um, the um, landscape, with cosmos, with the non-human or what we call nature. Um, and part of that, and then, then as a result, of once, you've, once you've done that, once you've woven that kinship, this, and this is, I think, like a key thing, then you value, you've learned to value the non-human in and of itself for its own potential, um, for its own possibility. And that's what we'll see. Um, uh, that's what I want to talk about a little bit. Because... Um, if you don't value it in and of itself, it's, you, it's not, you're not going to really value it. That is, in, in our culture, we tend to value it one, like, I, I keep seeing things, and they, I read a book about how whales speak, which I just, like, wanted to throw against the wall over and over, because it's all about all the scientific research and blah, 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 and the point of it all was how whales are, we're trying to find out that whales who like us and then we can value them. That doesn't work. It's like you need to value whales for whatever they are and leave them alone. Um, and the same with everything else. It's not, it, it, we value thing, things, are they useful to us or are they like us? That's all human centered. And the whole thing about ancient China is it's not human centered, it's, it's landscape and humans are only part of it. Actually, and I'm, maybe I'll show you, I'm mean going to show you these. Uh, these are for an examples of what's left. The, uh, the, the, the culture, the sort of unthought cultural assumptions come out in the arts. That's where we sort of tell these assumptions to ourselves. And we have some remains of, of Paleolithic assumptions in Paleolithic art. And this is from, these are pictures I took in uh, New Mexico. Uh, uh, pictographs. So the one thing, the interesting thing about this is there it is, it's right out in landscape, it's part of the landscape. That's right <laughs> under the rock. Um, and you see that there's animals, there's a sun, there's uh, a hand. Um, so maybe just there's 
clicked through, there's a couple of these. That one's really dark, but you can sort of see, and you can't quite see, but on the stone above that first one, there's more. And sort of, that, that art is sort of on all those stones going back. There's a, like an eagle, actually in the sky. There's a human right there in the landscape on my face. And then, okay, okay, you can stop there. So, and now here's the Chinese painting, which is very much the same thing. So that, this is like classic Chinese landscape art, reflecting the assumptions of this culture. No humans, it's just landscape in and of itself. And I just, I'm gonna show you some more of these in just a minute. Um, but I just wanna uh, mention the difference in the, sorry, that um, all these paintings are from like uh, 1200 or something. Most of both the, everything I show you will be around 1200, give or take a century or so. Um, and if you think about what Western art looked like, it was it's all human centered. It's all uh, Christian iconography or portraits. You don't really see landscape in, in Western art until into like the 18th or 19th, probably the 19th century. And then it's actually kind of short-lived. The 20th century moved out into, out of, into abstraction and you know the whole 20th century art thing. Um, okay. So maybe I'll just show you, yeah. So here, I'll just show you some of these Chinese paintings. I guess I have said what I want to say about them. Either the human is either not there, um, or it's very small, like that fisherman, or you can see people in the lower right there. But really, this is just like this landscape that's just like booming out at you with presence, presence, presence. There's a little person, the person walking across the bridge in this vast, very empty, full of emptiness, which is empty mind, empty, empty of self. I think that's the last. Is that right? I don't know. Any more? Oh no. Can you? Okay. Can you wait there? Just leave it there. Um. So you get a sense of what uh, of, of the Chinese of Chen's painting and poetry was the same. Um, it's about landscape. It's about things in and of themselves. Um, a big again a big contrast to Western literature, like the great masterworks of Western literature, or things like the Bible, the um, Paradise Lost, uh, Dante, they're all, con one, gigantic constructions that sort of consume the world in this human construction. Um, and they're all about human concerns, right? Uh, and usually kind of metaphysical Christian um, redemption kind of concerns. Even, even like Wordsworth's prelude, uh, uh, <clears throat> China, the natural world sort of exists as a soul-building machine. Um, and his smaller, uh, even his smaller poems are very, uh, compared to Chinese, the smaller poems which we think of as the beginning of sort of landscape poetry in the, in the West um, are pretty, are pretty um, self-centered. Self so, um, I think what I'm going to do is read. I was just thinking about remembering Wordsworth poems and where he said. I'm, I'll read a. I'm going to read a few um, typical. You know, these would be called the masterworks of Chinese literature. I'm going to want that even those things again. Mm -hmm. So the, now these poems are all written like uh, eighth century, eighth maybe ninth. Golden rain rapids. <clears throat> Wind buffets and blows autumn rain. Water cascading thin across rocks. Waves lash at each other. An egret startles up, white, then settles back. So, really small glancing gestures, pretty empty news of. Um, of this self, this kind of like self-separating from landscape. 
It's interesting in Chinese poems, and another way we do, we um, uh, inscribe that um, isolate, isolated, separate self, you know, um, that's our sort of unthought assumption uh, in our sort of culture, is in, is in um, the pronoun I we have to use all the time, right? Every time we say something. Like that poem in English, you'd say, might say, I watched or something. But in Chinese, especially Chinese poetry, I mean, you don't use that. You don't use that impersonal pronoun. It's just empty space. <clears throat> oh, here, here uh, is a is a, an, an exception that proves the rule. See, I, I didn't plan that. Reverence Pavilion Mountain, sitting alone. The birds have vanished into deep skies. A last cloud drifts away, all idleness. Inexhaustible, this mountain and I gaze at each other, hit the load remaining. Evening view. Already at South Tower. Even, I, I thought, oh. I actually, I should just change that to London Tower. Already at London Tower, evening stillness. In the darkness, a few forest birds astir. The bustling city wall sinks out of sight. Deeper, deeper, just four mountain peaks. Yeah, I guess I'm, we're in the city, right? Isn't this the city? Yeah. Already at London Tower, evening stillness. In the darkness, a few forest birds astir. The bustling city skyscrapers sink out of sight, deeper, deeper, just four mountain peaks. I guess that's a bit of a strap. Okay. <sighs> and the last one. This is the poem that, in this, this book, my newest book, um, comes back to this poem over and over. In fact, the first part of this book is, is titled just um, half seriously, half, half facetiously, How a Little Poem from Ancient China Could Save the Planet. <laughs> so this is a little poem. Egrets, robes of snow, crests of snow, and beaks of azure jade, they fish in shadowy streams, then startling up into flight, they leave emerald mountains for lit distances. Pear blossoms, a treeful, tumble in the evening wind. So, one of the most, the, we have a lot of ways of um, sort of cultivating this um, kinship with the non-human. Um, of weaving consciousness, and they really were thinking about not any kind of superficial idea of this, but profoundly weaving consciousness back into um, the, not the nature. Um, so I want to end with um, a little journey inside yourselves to see how this kinship worked for them at deep levels and how they did this. The most, it's probably the most basic and essential way they did this was, was meditation, Chan meditation, which I'm just going to talk you through um, the kind of basic philosophical outlines of this. Um, so you can close your eyes if you want. And what Chan meditation was about was watching what's, just watching what's going on in your mind. And if you sit quietly for a minute with your eyes closed and just start watching what's going on, and you start seeing thoughts that are sort of coming, trading around. The first amazing thing for the ancient Chinese that you see is, oh, I am watching my thoughts. I'm separate from them. And we in the West think that that thought machine is the essence of us, is the self, is the soul. Um, and that that's, then that's what defines us. That's what we are. But wonder of wonders, here we are in 15 seconds uh, of meditation, and we realize, oops, that's not what I am. I'm watching that from somewhere else. 
And then if you sit and you keep watching um, quietly, you start noticing how thoughts work. Um, you might slow down enough that you can start watching how they work and you realize that thoughts are, a new thoughts appear. They then go without evolve through their transformations. They might lead to another thought. You might come back and start obsessing over the same thought um, in variations and maybe it ends and then a new thought begins. But basically thoughts begin, they evolve through some transformations and then they end. And that just keeps going and going and going. New, one new thought after another. And the thing that people that aim to ancient Chinese realized about that is, oh, that works just like everything else. If you think about what goes on outside in the natural world, it's all about change, right? It's all about change. Everything is constantly changing, changing, changing. Nothing holds still. The West likes permanence. They like to imagine things that hold still. Um, but reality is nonstop change. Um, easy way to see that is the seasons. In, in, um, okay, in winter, uh, it's still and quiet and seems dead, but in it is, is the, the possibility of life. Life emerges in spring, goes through its changes in summer, dies back into fall, just like everything else, just like you and me. Um, and um, our thoughts do the same thing. So then the, the realization is, oh, my mind is absolutely part of the same tissue as everything else. So there you are, you're weaving yourself back into things. You sit still longer and you, and you watch thoughts fall silent and you realize, oh, now I'm sitting at the silent source of thoughts, in fact, at the source of everything. Um, it's very, it's almost quick and easy, but you know, you can spend a lifetime doing it. And then the, um, at that point, in that silent, with that silent mind, what the John people call the empty mind, if you open your eyes, you see, everything you see is, you see as a mirror. It's, it's you have become a mirror what you see sort of goes inside of you and becomes you. You're nothing other than what you see, nothing other than what's in that mirror. That's the place that um, art like this happens. That's what that person is doing, looking out at that landscape. He's em his empty mind mirrored to weaving landscape and consciousness together. That's what that painting's all about. And that's how we're supposed to look at these paintings. When they have, when they have no people in them, maybe they have a, an example like this. Um, because they're, the paintings were kind of part of this practice of reweaving consciousness and landscape. Same with the poems. Um, and that's a kind of a beautiful place once we're completely woven in together. That's a beautiful place where you can start thinking about environmental activism, about making changes. And I, rem I remember early Greenpeace people and Earth First people, they talked about themselves this way as Earth defending itself. That is, there, I'm, just, I'm just Earth defending itself. So I just want to hand with one last poem to like settle into that place, um, which is essentially a description of this meditative reweaving that I was talking about. It starts with someone who's self-absorbed the way we always are and distracted and ends in this place of this mirror, deep clarity. That's only four, 20 words. Autumn begins unnoticed. Nights slowly lengthen, and little by little, clear winds turn colder and colder, summer's blaze giving way. My thatch hut grows still. At the bottom stair, in butch grass, Lit do shimmers. Thank you. Thanks, Abhi. You don't have to. David, thank you so much for so beautifully and wonderfully orienting us in that wave of consciousness and landscape and all that knowledge.
reflection and meditation.